and welcome to Talk Art. I'm Sally Rain, and I'll be your host as we delve into the world of the artist and the art that's all around us. Talk Art is sponsored by the Silicon Valley Open Studios. During the first three weekends in May, hundreds of local artists open their studios to the public. For more information, you can go to the website svos.org. Our guest, Barbara Burke, is a sculptor who weaves metal by hand, off loom, and one piece at a time. She has created jewelry, like the piece that I'm wearing, and now she works in larger formats using stainless steel and bronze. She's here to demonstrate how she creates her art. So welcome, Barbara. Thank you, Sally. I'm delighted to be here. Excellent. So tell us, how did you get interested in weaving metal? It's such an interesting concept. Um, I had um, been introduced to antique jewelry and was fascinated by it, and I started to learn about antique jewelry. Um, and then fate happened. My husband got a terrific career opportunity. We moved from New York to San Diego, and right. it turns out that San Diego State has a really fabulous metalsmithing program. Oh, and I had an opportunity to go, to go up to campus and take classes. And the program was actually founded by the woman, Arlene Fish, um, who literally wrote the book on applying textile techniques to metal. And so I found myself in Arlene's classroom in that very first semester. And that's where it all started. Wow. So we, what we drew you to weaving, though, and metal? I, and, I and manipulated a lot of fabric as a kid. I'd done a lot of sewing um, and some arts and crafts and summer camps and basket weaving. And it resonated. It's what my fingers want to do. So weaving and metal, what draws you to metal? Um, metal, the way it feels, the way it feels in my hand, the way it moves, the way it can be manipulated. What's wonderful about um, metal as opposed to fabric is that it will hold its shape in a way that fabric doesn't. Fabric, um, at least in a garment, needs the body right. to support it and to provide structure and to be, literally, to be the skeleton right. that, the, that, that the garments are draped on. Um, but depending on the choice of metal and the thickness of the metal, the diameter of the wire, the temper of the metal that you start with, um, and the characteristics of the metal, it will, um, you can either, um, in this case, we have a, an ancient rug weaving technique. Um, this is an, um, a Renaissance lace making technique, and so you can create structure. Um, and whether you're weaving or I'm weaving um, in, a rec in a rectangular form or in a linear pattern, um, I can create shape with that, and then the shapes and the forms um, will, um, will stabilize and will hold themselves together. Well, that's great. Well, you brought some images for us to take a look at of some finished pieces I and did. details. I did. So let's take yes. a look at those yes. now. Yes, yes. And uh, this is one of my early bronze pieces. It's, it's called Vertigo. It's uh, made in sumac. It's an ancient rug weaving technique. Um, and I named it Vertigo because I was weaving it. That's actually um, four feet of woven wire, and that's four wires wide. Um, and I was um, in the process of weaving it when I had a Vertigo attack. And so I think that that had something to do with the final shape that the piece took. And this is a close-up, um, a vertigo of one of the ends. So is that the base part? That's the base, yes. That's really interesting. And then this is the other end. This is a close-up of the other end of the, uh, of the coiling, of the wrapping of the spirals, yes. So you weave it and then you spiral. I weave it flat and straight and then shape it, which you can see in this piece in Michael's Waves as well. Um, this piece was two wires wide, and it started at the far end. And then I spread the wire so that I could create um, a lacy area, and that gave me more arms to shape, which gives me the additional curls there. And then this is a close-up. You see where the, where the larger wires are spread further apart, and you, that gives you a close-up of the lace. So you spread the wires. Is that a different weaving technique, or is that still the same weaving pattern? It's the same weaving pattern. It looks different, um, and it looks less dense and more airy because the thick wires are further apart. They're not directly next to each other. 
So how large is that? How wide is that um, one strand? That strand is probably that main one that we're looking at that is the diagonal that goes into the center. That's probably about half an inch, maybe five-eighths of an inch wide. Okay, so this is very fine wire. Yes, this is very fine wire, yeah. And then how do you bend it like that? Well, um, the bronze and many metals have a, a wonderful um, characteristic um, that it's soft enough to manipulate and, um, and weave with my fingers. But in the process of weaving, when you move metal, it work hardens. And so it work hardens in the process of the weaving, and then it work hardens again in the process of shaping. So ultimately, when you've got the right balance of the size of the wire and the, the alloy um, of the metal and then the thickness, um, it will then hold its shape. So work hardens means when you work it, it gets harder. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. That's precisely what it means. OK. So this is what my uh, studio looks like. This was um, when Vertigo, when I was in the process of making Vertigo, that is a vise that's attached to a bench. Um, that jaw is five inches wide. And you can see the four bronze wires that are parallel next to each other that are held in the red jaws of the vise. And then behind it, you can just about make out on the uh, upper right corner is the spool of the thin uh, bronze wire. And that is what I'm using as the weaver to actually create the piece. It looks sort of like a sewing machine. <laughs> it has elements of it's it. It's got similar elements yeah. in, in terms of the machine. You're sitting in front of the machine and then working it. Right. Yes, yes. The bobbin. Yes. And then here we have a, um, a schematic of the sumac technique itself. So you see the thicker wires, the vertical wires that run from top to bottom. Those are called warps. Um, and then you've got the thinner wire, which starts in the lower left corner, called the weft. And that wraps around each of the vertical elements. Um, you see that the pattern is in front of two and then back around one. It creates a very dense pattern. And that's one of the things that contributes to the structural integrity of the pieces uh, when they're done. Great. So you brought some I have, weaving I for have. us. I have. So, let's so take we can a look. move from the schematic to to the vice so in the studio. This is the sumac. That, that is the did, sumac. This has been spread out a little bit. Yes, yes. Uh, you can see where your fingers are, where I have spread the wires apart. Yes. So that's where it's. When you say it's lacy, that's what yes, you mean. Yes, yes, precisely. This is thick, and it is hard. It's, I can't bend it at all. It's interesting. Once it's moved into shape, it's it, yeah. it's going to hold its shape, which which in fact is what you want. Um, if you buy a piece of sculpture, you don't want it to no. change shape. You <laughs> well, want it to look at home the way it looks in in exactly. the studio when you first seen it. And so that whole concept of structural integrity is really very important to me. Yes. No. I I can. See that. So how? Okay. Show us how you. All right. So here. So this is a smaller version. This of is a, what you a work small on. version. I've got five wires of stainless steel, and these are thicker to give you an idea. And I've lined them up, and I've already begun to start the weaving. To uh, you can see that it's held together with uh, masking tape. Masking tape is a very critical component in a studio, um, and I'm now locking it in the vise. This is a three inch jawed vise. And what this does um, is that it leaves both of my hands free. Right. Um, typically with a loom, it, you have a, um, it's a closed system where the vertical elements are um, um, attached to the loom frame at top and at right. bottom. Um, with the vise, this enables me to have an open system and it creates an easier way to work with the metal. Um, this, uh, the turquoisey color here, the peacock blue, is actually coated copper, and it's very soft, and it will um, work smoothly. And so it's particularly um, effective for, for demonstrations. The other point that I want to make um, is that I have a long tube here, which was also in the previous slide. Um, this controls the, uh, the wire when I'm manipula manipulating it so that it doesn't kink because once the wire kinks, it's going to break. 
and then you have to take it apart and start all oh, over again. No. And oh no, indeed, we don't want to do no. that. Um, so is this? All one piece of wire. All that the way is through. all one piece wow. of wire and all the, the way through, ones are and also the bigger wow. ones are too. Yes. Interesting. Yes. Okay. Well, show um, us the weaving. And in terms of the wonderfulness of materials, these little tubes that I have taped together are actually the protector tubes from acupuncture needles. Oh. So these have been the uh, contribution of my acupuncturist. <laughs> okay. Yes. So here, um, and we talked in the schematic, this is where the stitch is going to go over two and then back around one and over two and back around one. And so it's a matter of repeating each of the stitches. So it's stitch upon stitch and then row upon row. And you can begin to see what each of those rows look like there does you go. It, yeah, yes. Does it matter how tight you pull it? Do you have to make it a certain tension or um, like can you knitting, it up? like mm -hmm. like crocheting? You you develop your own gauge, your own sense mm -hmm. of tension. Um, if it's very very loose, then the weave is going to be very. Then the finished weave is going to be wobbly, and you may want that if you're going to create. Um, if there's going to be a different skeleton or a frame that's going to provide the structure. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want the piece itself to provide the structure, then you don't want a loose, loopy right. weave because it won't hold its shape. And so I then use one of my favorite tools. This is a pair of pliers with nylon jaws. And the key to the nylon is that it doesn't mar the metal right. because if you've um, chipped the color in the coated copper, you can't restore it. Oh. And if you've put a nick or a chip into it, um, the wire is not thick enough that you can file it out and still have something left afterwards. So ideally, you don't want to put marks in the metal. No. And so wood tools and nylon tools are the way to do that, is to not nick them in the first place. So with these jaws, I can then grab the wire, the vertical wires, and then pack it down. So you prim <clears throat> primarily work with just one color, or do you like other weaving, weave in other colors sometimes? How does that um, For the most part, my weaving is monochromatic. I'm working with one color throughout. Um, in the very beginning, I started um, playing with a variety of colors. And what I discovered is that in many cases, the color field isn't large enough to be able to read multiple colors. Oh. And mm -hmm. so what you wind up with is something that looks muddy instead. Hmm. Yeah, because it is very small stitches. It's, yes, yes. Also so the individual stitches, stitches are very small. And so they're additive. And when you pack them together, you can begin to see the color, but not with the tape in front of it. Beautiful. And yeah. so that's that's how. So this is called the sumac. This is sumac. Um, sumac is an ancient rug weaving technique. It's named for the city in Azerbaijan in mm. the Caucasus in which the technique originated. Um, and in the Western, um, so in the Western world, it's um, become pronounced as sumac, S-O-U-M-A-K. Great, and you do the smaller structures with this. Um, I have done small structures. Um, I started in jewelry 20 years ago, and so the pendant you're wearing is a perfect example of that. And <laughs> so the same technique um, is this piece in the stainless steel. And if you s crush it or try to crush it, you see how springy yeah, it is yeah. and how much it's going to hold its shape. Right. And so that's two wires wide. And so that's the same stitch, the same test sample, actually. It's one of the early ones I did in the bronze. So these are tests, so I the, can squish them. <laughs> yes, you can squish them. You can try to squish them. Uh, yeah, no, they don't change shape at what all. That's you can do with them. And so those I did um, in the very, very beginning so that I could establish finger feel, so that I could learn um, what the metals will do right. and what size wire I needed to start with um, 
and if I even liked working with the industrial metals. Right. Because it's very important that my fingers like the feel of the wires that oh, I'm working well, yeah, with. Oh, yeah, of course. So does the bronze ha react differently to the, than the stainless steel and to how strong it is or the structure? Um, or are they the similar? The bronze is heavier than the steel, but the bronze moves more easily than mm. the steel. So it's, it's heavier, but it's a, it's a little softer. Um, they're similar in terms of welding, so I use a pulse arc welder to finish off the ends so oh. that you don't get... Um, oh yeah, they're smooth. Yes, nice. yes, so that, so that the ends are smooth. Um, so there, there are similar settings for the, for the bronze and the stainless steel. Um, the, the, probably the biggest thing that's different aside from the color, you've got a cool color on the stainless steel and the warm color on the bronze, is that the bronze will naturally oxidize. Hmm. And so while it starts out this wonderful salmony um, peach color, when I start working with it, it will, um, it will darken over time. Oh, yeah. Interesting. Yes. Well, you have this technique that you've shown us, and you have a, another technique. That I do. I do. It's bobbin lace, right? It is. It and you is. have a, an image to show us of how that looks and what the schematic for yes. that is. Yes, yes. Yes, and so what you see here, as I move back, um, so the bobbin lace, this is, um, what you're seeing here is a basic stitch. We have two pairs of wires, and then on the left side we have A, a and B is one pair, and C and D is another pair. And as you move from left to right, you see how the, the individual wires interact with each other to create the stitch. And as one continues down, um, you see um, the ribbon that then results from, um, from using those individual stitches. And so I have a demonstration here. So set this, up. Is, this is what you're going to end up with? That's what you end up with. So that's the okay. stainless steel. And that is an example of that is, well, let's see, we have two, uh, two, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there are eight pairs, um, eight pairs of wires that interact with each other and then cross um, to create the structure for the individual stitches. And I have um, a demonstration set up. I've duplicated that pattern here with coated copper wire. Um, and so you see here the diagonals, the diamond shape yes. that is created um, by the movement. This is called a torsion, T-O-R-C-H-O-N. It's a torsion ground. Oh, okay. So it's a, a, um, a pattern that originated in the Renaissance. So it's 1500s, 1600s. Um, That's beautiful. And so this also was a test sample to see what, um, again, how the wires would behave and to establish the uh, thickness of the individual wires in relation to the size of the stitch and needing to make sure that my fingers would be able to work that tight right. to be able to, uh, to push the steel, to push the stainless so steel into place. tell us how you set it up. Okay, how I have set this up. Um, the lace, um, unlike the weaving, where we had two elements uh, that were essentially parallel, uh, the vertical elements were parallel, and then we introduced a horizontal, right. a perpendicular okay. element to it. With lace, we essentially have one set of elements that all trend in the same direction. And so to start the pattern, uh, the pattern is created um, on graph paper, and you can just about see, yep, can here see we the go, dots, um, yeah. the dots. And those dots indicate where the wires cross each other. And so I want to follow the pattern. I have all of this resting on, um, on a cork board, which has, is backed with masonite. So it provides it with a tremendous amount of strength. And I can pick it up, and, and I can move it, and, and it will um, stay flat and straight. And so you've begun to see I've got some wires in place here. And the pins, and these are T-pins that keep the wires in place until they're locked in place 
by the subsequent rows. And so you also see how the wires get caught on each other. And okay, so the basic stitch is a right over left on the two pairs is right over left and right over left again. And then we've got a left over right, and I'm going to lock it in place with a pin. And then that's the half stitch. And then for the rest, the other half of the stitch, we've got right over left and right over left. And then we have left over right. And so this is what creates the basic intersection, which is the fundamental stitch. And then I'm going to cross right over left again. This adds strength to it. It adds um, interest to the pattern. And again, the idea of moving the metal is going to add strength to it. And then I reposition the pins to keep them flatter and out of the way so that I can okay. see what I'm doing. So you're not actually, you're putting them next to the wire in the Yes, board. yes, yes. And they're just yes. there to keep them in the position. So the wire, yeah, the pins are leaning up against the wire. Up the okay. bigger pieces. You must use lots and lots of pins. I use lots and lots of pins. But I can also take them out from the previous rows once the wires, here we go, are locked in place. Oh, so yeah. I can take them from here and I can move them down. Oh, that makes sense. So once, once it's woven into its pattern, it will stay that way. It will, yes. Right. Very. So it doesn't, it's not like knitting if you let it go. No. <laughs> Um, no, that is true. Um, and in fact, if one knits with wire um, and you drop a stitch, it will not unravel the way yarn unravels. Oh, that's nice. Because it's metal. The metal will stay right. where you put it. Um, now, I do not knit. I discovered in that very first class, class with Arlene Fish that the techniques that I did not do well as a kid in yarn, I do even less well in wire. Yep. So I do not knit and I do not crochet. But the weaving resonates and the lace resonates as well. Right, oh, that's a beautiful technique. And so I've got two wires on the outside that create the frame. Do they, do those outside wires always stay on the outside or do they move across? And... Um, it depends okay. on the pattern. On, in this pattern? In, in this pattern, I keep the wires on the, on the outside edge um, because it provides more strength that way. Um, but I could, in fact, create the edge with the wire that is moving diagonally through the pattern that then looks different um, and it acts different structurally. So we've created, we've, we've completed one of the diagonals and I'm going to go back here to the right side and start again. So we have left over right and so it's similar with the right over left and the left over right we've got the wires constantly moving not only forwards but up and down right. and so that also adds strength and you so you're constantly hearing me talk about strength, strength yes. and the structural integrity so that the pieces hold their shape. Well you brought some images of larger pieces in your studio I so have. now that we've seen the smaller piece let's take a look at those now. Okay. All right, so this is what the, uh, this is what the lace looks like when I'm, I'm uh, working on it in the studio. The pattern is much larger, the cork boards are much larger. Rather than having them laying in front of me on a table, they're actually standing upright on an easel. And the wires uh, go all the way across the, the floor. The wires are all over the floor. So I'm typically working with 10 to 15 feet um, wow. of, of, of each wire. And at the very beginning, when the pattern gets established, I'm tripping all over wires on the floor and constantly having to, um, to unravel them so that I can continue. Yes. And so this is the closer look um, of the stainless steel. This is the four and a half inch wide band. Um, and this was actually the piece that um, is uh, behind me in the, uh, in the studio here. Yes. So that's what it looks like when it's made, when it's made in the studio. This is um, another piece. This um, was a piece that I started um, 
and I wound up with this three inch diameter band and I wound up creating something that looks like a bow and while I was very pleased with the top of the bow I didn't know what to do with the bottom and it was too open and I needed to figure something else out. Um, ultimately I decided that what it really needed was some more, another band of, um, of lace, another ribbon that was added to it and to try and figure out what that was going to look like I used um, um, some um, ribbon, um, some black transparent ribbon with wire edges and so the wire edges enable me to manipulate the ribbon so that it will hold its shape and I liked what I was looking at here and so I could then measure the length of the black ribbon that simulates the idea um, and that determined um, how long the second lace uh, ribbon was going to be which is what we have coming up in the next slide there you go and so I've put the two in place and I really like the top and I needed to figure out what I was going to do with I now have four bands at the bottom and um, ultimately what I decided I realized I took it off the easel and started uh, positioning the bottom bands in such a way that the piece would sit um, rest on a table or on a pedestal and I got it this far and was stuck. Um, I also realized that the weight of the piece wasn't going to hold itself up. Um, so here we're looking at lace one. This was the first piece that we looked at when we were seeing the 10 to 15 feet wi uh, long wires in the studio. This is a close-up of lace one. This is one of the ends and how I decided to treat the, uh, the ends. This is now lace two and this is what I wound up doing with those two bands that started out looking like ribbons. Beautiful. Thank you. And this is, this is a close-up of, of And that's bottom. now a hanging piece. And that is now a hanging piece, yes. That's what the piece wanted to be, yes. And it's hanging right here. It's hanging right here, yes and it it's is. it's beautiful. <laughs> and, then it, and it can twist, right? Yes, so if, if you, you move it. If you move it, it twists yes, and there's will shadows. rotate, yes, yes. Well, it's yes. beautiful work. Thank, Thank you, you so Thank much you, for Sally. coming to Talk Art and Thank showing you us so how much. you create it.